Whenever you're ready. All right. Okay. All right. Um, welcome to chapter seven, everyone. Um, so this is chapter seven of Advanced R by Hadley Wickham. My name is Darren Ramsden, and I'm going to walk through it to the best of my ability. All right. So I'm using the Lunar package, um, which uses Shiny, um, so just to give you a little background. So um, one of the first things he talks about in chapter seven is that he recalls that R has four primary scoping rules. So we just go over them what they are, right? Um, one is name masking, which means that names defined inside a function mask names that are outside the function. And if a name cannot be found, R looks one level up, whatever that means. We'll figure it out. We'll make some uh, progress towards understanding that today. Um, and then there's functions versus variables. So if you use a name in a function call, then objects that are not functions get ignored in the search. And then the third principle is a fresh start, which is every time a function is called, a new environment gets created. And then the last thing is dynamic lookup which is that R only looks for values when it needs them, right? So those are the four principles that we would have brought over from previous chapter. Okay, All right, so we're using the word environment in that previous slide, and this chapter is titled environment. So, um, but, you know, but here's just some, you know, a high level, well, summary of what environments are, right? So an environment is, is a data structure that has a job, which is simply to bind a set of names to a set of values. And that is the key takeaway about environments, right? Environments differ from lists in the following ways. Every name must be unique. The names in an environment are not ordered, meaning that if you use a numeric index, it, that is not meaningful in terms of an environment. There's no first member or second member or third member. Um, the third thing is an environment has a parent. Lists don't have parents. And environments are not copied when modified, i.e. they use reference semantics. Right, so, um, so the basics, right? You can create environments using, um, in, the R, in the Rlang package, is the end function, and in base R, there's new.env. And then I show you some, um, some functions from Rlang and from base R that can give you some descriptive information. So env print gives you descriptive information. Um, env names just gives you a list of names. Those are from Rlang. And then the names function from, sorry, again, something in the chat here. Okay. Um, each name value binding is a frame. Okay, so there's a question in the chat here. Each, so the, the frames, as I understand it, are related to the call stack, which come later. Okay. Okay, so I ran some code before to load our data set, to load the, the files from our data set. So they're in here, right? So I'll, I'll create an environment. Um, what is that again? Sorry. So brewing materials and beer text, right? So I can have brewing materials. What is That's so cool? <laughs> well, all right, so let me run this code. Wow, that should run. Why is that not running? Okay, let me see. I can run these. I was running. Okay. 
right well okay so under here i can do a end uh print and Right, so, well, apart from the fact that it's being obscured by the, um, the, the, the messages from, from readr, from read underscore CSV, right? So, created an environment using the, the rlang env command, okay, which would be here, and then printed it using env print, right? And when you printed it, you see a list of the names and it's telling you, well, brewing materials are tibble, beer taxes are tibble, right? Okay, so important environments. Um, well, so he mentions two key environments. One is the current environment, which is where the code is currently executing, and then the global environment, which is known as your workspace. Um, these are often the same, but not necessarily. Now, in the book, he uses this identical command to run it and show that it's true. Here it will not because we're inside a shiny app and the current environment is not the global environment. So as opposed to the book, which gave an output of true, and I run this code, I should get false. Yeah, let me start over. Right? So I use the identical command to, comp to see if the global environment and the current environment were the same. And then you turn false, right? Um, you cannot use the equal equal operator with environments. It doesn't make sense. Okay, all right. The next thing about environments is parents, right? So each, each environment has a parent. You can see that we have this environment over here and there's a parent environment that it points to. And that parent environment in this particular example has its own parent as the empty environment, right? So what is a parent? The parent is where R looks next to find names that are not found, that are not bound in the current environment. Um, and that parent will have a parent and eventually that sequence of parents will terminate in at, well, at the, what's called the empty environment, right? And, okay, and the parent can be set at the time you're creating the environment. Um, both R and base R uh, have, have functions to create the parent environment. The current environment will be used if you don't specify what the, you know, what the parent environment is. And then there are functions called env parent in rlang and parent env, parent.env in base. And, and rlang also has another function which gives you the entire list of parents going all the way back. So, all right, so I can create a new environment. Um, I can say bear end. So that'll be bear end two and bear end. Um, new name equal something. Well, hmm, can I go back here? Can I go back here? Let me get this one. Let me get this. Okay. Right. Why? Okay. That doesn't work either. All right. We'll go back to create a new environment. That will not work. I might have to get everything. This was working before. Um, all right, let's run this code. Okay, so we have a lot of stuff going on here. Um, okay, so variant two was created with bear env as its parent, right? 
So now you can get nth parent What is this? All right, sure, fine. That doesn't work. Okay, so nothing is being saved between sessions, run code. Um, Ironically, I think this is, is this a session thing or an environment thing? <laughs> That's a, it's a good, uh, it's a, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think it's a session thing. Um, I think it's a session thing. Let me see. Let me start over. Right? So I got my nth parent of here too. It's coming up here. Um, I guess. And I do an end print of band. All right, so, right. So this is the parent, parent of bear nth two, and this is the, this is the address of bear of the original, right? So they have the same address. Um, okay, all right. Um, yeah, so previously, like two pages back, I had said that, um, you know, the sequence of parents terminates at the empty environment. So um, my previous mental model was that the parent environment contains, well, you know, well, they don't use the word child, but the environment is contained within the parent. But which kind of led me to some difficulty in understanding how come the environment that contains all the others is actually empty. So, um, so my new mental model is that um, the parent doesn't contain the child. Um, is that when you create an environment, you have a link to a parent, but you're not contained within the parent, right? So the way I, I'm thinking about it right now is that the environment remembers where its parent lives. Right, so the empty environment is empty in the sense that it doesn't contain any names. Okay, all right. Then, all right, so the next thing is super assignment, right? So super assignment is this, uh, well, super version of the assignment operator. And it's different from the typical assignment arrow in that it never creates a new variable if the left-hand side name is not bound. What it does is it will look for a variable in our parent environment to modify, right? So I run some code here. So this, I think in, in the book he uses x, he sets x to one. I changed it slightly, right? So I can make it 21, right? Run that code, right? So x, so in the function, if this had been an assignment, what would have happened? If this had been an assignment, x, x after the function call would have remained what we set it to be, right? But you use super assignment and the, the assignment within the function uh, changes the, the x in the parent. All right. So, and then um, just some, well, I guess some rules. Um, I saw in the Q&A, there's a question here that um, about the, the bracket, which I'm not sure I have a good answer to, but um, dollar sign and double bracket work similar to with lists with the exceptions that um, double, you know, bracket bracket cannot be used with numeric indices. That's consistent with the idea that environments don't have ordered elements. Um, the single bracket does not work with environments. Um, and I saw that there was a question in the Q&A about that. I have some informed thoughts, but maybe some other people have as well. Um, dollar sign and bracket bracket return null if the binding does not exist. 
Um, and then the other thing is, unlike um, elsewhere, if you bind a name to null, the name doesn't get removed from the environment. And the reason is that, you know, null is a value that you could potentially want to have something set to. Right. Um, there's a couple other functions, um, you know, it goes through, I don't know if you want to go through details. So, um, env poke adds a binding using a string and a value. Env bind is to bind multiple. Env has will tell you if a name exists. Env unbind unbinds a name, right? So now uh, let me just see. Uh, so I'm assuming this doesn't work. All right, so, so let me create a new env equal env. Uh, else. All right, so we're gonna run this. As you can do in pairs, and the end of one is gonna happen here. True. As, all right, so about three. Right, so for instance, env has will tell you if this environment has a variable named var1 or var2. Um, let's see, env bind, env unbind. All right, so let's, let's unbind var2. Um, and var2. And print. Let's see. Right. So, right. So, what do we do? Created an environment with var one and var two. Um, check to see if var one was in there. See if var three is in there. So we got true and false, as you would expect. Then we unbinded the name var two, and when we printed it. If R2 doesn't exist, right? Okay. Um, and then there's a mention of two exotic variants, which is um, delayed bindings, which, is that true? Delayed, is that the name? Um, delayed bindings, which are evaluated the first time they're accessed. And I'll give an example here. Is lazy bindings, right? So there's this function here where um, right, so if we run this code here, this function here, this is a lazy binding, but we're binding what is it? We're making a call to sys.sleep. Right? But because it's a lazy binding, when we print it both times, we get the same output, right? Whereas an active binding is, gets evaluated every single time. So you have a, we're binding to the current environment and we're binding Z1, which is a function which generates a random uniform variable between zero and one, right? And then, so we do that binding and every time we evaluate Z1, Z1 being a function, we run the function again. So I'll run this code and what happens here? So you see that Z1, the function gets evaluated every single time we output it. All right, so this is the first call. This is the second call. We can add third and then you see the first two change, right? Because I'm running this entire block of code. All right. So, um, and then you talk about recursing over environments. Um, and he gives a recursive implementation and then he leaves the framework of the, of the iterative implementation, which is, a, you know, these are two functions. Where and, so where's the one from the book? And where two is what I filled in 
from the template that he had for the iterative. Um, so, right, so what he does is he, he just writes a function that um, it says, if you get to the empty environment and you haven't found a name, you say that you haven't found it. Um, if you empty environment, you haven't found a name, you go to your parent. And if you are in the empty environment, if, if you are not in the empty environment, you have found a name, you return the current environment, right? And then that, that, that's, a rec that's the logic behind the recursive implementation. And then the iterative implementation is using a while loop in this function here called where two, which I just call it the where two is doing the same recursive look, right? So if I did where two of a name, let's say mean, if we run, where is it? Okay, I have to run this code. Let's see. Okay, so it says that it, so it searches and it finds the mean function in base, right? So if I were to do where to uh, filter, what's gonna happen? Now run. Okay, so, all right, so I did a where to of the function filter. Right, and what that did was it told me that filter is in package stats, right? So I can do library dplyr because I know dplyr has a function called where to has has a function called filter that mass. Stats filter, right? So right, so where to search, so the first call happened before attaching dplyr and where to found um, filter in packet stats. And then the second call happens after attaching dplyr and it finds um, the function in the package dplyr. Uh, Darren, can I interrupt? How did you get base on the first one for the mean? Um, base, is the, base is the environment that, that that the primitives are in. So let's see. Um, well, okay, yeah, okay. So, well, the function would have been going through, right? So let me see. Oh, so, sorry, I'm missing some stuff in the chat here. Yeah, I'm missing some stuff in the chat here. So. What I, okay, so what I could do in here while um, I could end current, end, right? Let me see if this runs, right? So, and Okay. Is this? All right, maybe I should have thought about what I was doing before I did that. Okay, so some stuff is going on here because I have a bunch of environments um, loaded. So it's even going through Shiny and all the other stuff. <laughs> but so I'm um, okay. So I'm I'm actually print. So this, so this is, um, so at every step in the recursion here, I'm printing the list of bindings, right? So this is well. So I loaded dplyr. So dplyr is there. Rlang is there. So this is, sorry, you can't see what my finger is doing. So this is Rlang package. Just look in there. There's no mean. It goes into Lunar, which is a package that. Um, um, that I used to make the presentation. Lunar's parent is shiny. Shiny doesn't have mean. Um, then we go to stats. No, 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 no. So this is shiny. 
Chinese parents is stats. Uh, stats doesn't have mean in it. Um, stats is parent is graphics, etc. Graphics is packages, GR devices, utils, data sets, methods. What are we looking for? Auto loads. And then eventually we get to base. So it's going through the sequence of parents until we find an environment that has that name in it. And base is the last. Um, so base, was, base is the environment that the mean function, the primitive mean is defined in. Okay. All right. So, all right, so, uh, so that's kind of an example of what's coming now, right? Which is that um, a package, package environments in the search path, right? So every attached package becomes a parent of the global environment. So and the most recent attached package becomes the immediate parent and links to the previous parent as its own. And the search path is a term given to the sequence of all attached packages and going back to the empty environment. And the last two packages on the search path are always autoloads and base, as we actually would have seen all the way at the bottom of here, right? So this is base, which is the parent of autoloads, right? So this is the picture from the book, right? Okay. Darren, before we go on, that that example of the code was a really awesome work through for me for like seeing masking happen in real time. I was okay. wondering, you don't have to do this right now, just the possibility. Could you change that recursion loop to to uh, return both the dplyr filter and the base uh filter? Yeah. yeah, so, well, what we could do is um, we'd have to create a list outside. Huh. I don't know if, if I'm getting in here. All right, so what, what, okay, so conceptually what we'd have to do, we'd actually have to use super assignment, I think is the easiest way to do. So we'd have to create a list outside of the where and not terminate until we got to the empty environment. And then every time we came across a filter, we have to append to the list. Okay, so here goes um, my list. If, uh, I wonder, um, I want, all right, let me see. I want um I want the vector. I didn't thing. mean to put you on the spot. That <laughs> that like high level logic is enough, and then I can throw it in the Slack channel if we wanna okay. if people wanna <laughs> take. Prayer. Wait, no, all right. I I might come back to it because I, yeah, all right. I might come back to it, but actually, all right. Let me let me get five minutes. Um. Okay. So what I want is I don't want to terminate. I don't want to return here. So what I want to do, how do I append to a list? Okay, so index my list index. Um, and in, in. Okay, so, all right, so I'm not returning. All right, so, all right, so I'm not going to return if I find the name, but I'm going to append to my list. I'm going to make this blank.
All right, let's see. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Okay. Okay. Then I work. Sorry. Okay, right? So I got these two functions. Woohoo! All right. Everybody buy that? No objections? Okay. All right. Yeah, I think we were here. Okay, so, and yeah, well, okay, I'll, I'll skip that. Um, so yeah, so the function environment, right? So when a function is created, it binds the current environment, right? That's not the same thing as when we say a name is bound to the function on function creation. Like that, that typically happens, right? When you create a function, um, you, uh, I, I didn't finish the sentence here, but um, when, when you create a function, you almost always use a name, at, at, at least I have, right? So a name is bound to the function when you create it and a function binds an environment, but it's not necessarily, the function doesn't necessarily bind the environment that the name is in. Um, it, it, it's, it's probably the most common case, but we have a couple of different examples in the book. So in the left side here, we have a function f, which is created, is bound to a name f, and it binds the same environment it was created in, specifically. The other example is that um, the function, um, the function is bound, is bound, there's a name g bound to the function, but the function environment, the function binds the global environment. Right, sorry. And this is the code from the book. Right, so we create an environment E. And then within E, we create a function G. By default, G's environment is the current environment, which will be the global environment. And then, um, and then we use the function env command to get the environment of G. And then, um, and then I use the identical command here to see if the to see if the function environment of G, which is in E, is in fact the parent of E. Um, so that made sense to me when I was reading it before. I hope it made sense when I was saying it. Right, so, um, right, so I can do identical, E and E, right, right, so, so G is in E, but the environment uh, well, so G is a name bound in E, but um, the environment, G's environment is not E, but in fact, it's the parent of E. All right. Yeah, so, and then I actually just preempted using, so the next thing is this, there's this fn underscore n function, what is the environment from the base R to get the environment of a function, right? So here's a, just another example from the book. Y is one, um, F is a function that returns X plus Y. Um, then we get the environment of F and we get the environment of, well, you get the environment of F two different ways. One from the, um, one from Arlang and one from base, right? 
run that code. Well, it's probably not to use. All right. And then the next important thing is namespaces. Um, okay. So the question is the question arises: How do you avoid ambiguity caused by varying the order of attaching the packages? Right. Because as we discussed, as we talked about before, the the when you attach a package, it becomes the immediate parent of the global environment, which means that the order that you attach packages in can change the the search path, right? So the question is now, how do how 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 does a package that uses functions know that? well, verify that it's going to use the, the right function from the search path. Um, and the short answer is that packages have a different sequence of parents. And the longer answer is that um, a package has two environments. One is the package environment, which is what's accessible to the outside world um, or people who use in the library or require functions. And then there's the namespace environment, which is internal to the package and all bindings in the package environment. So the namespace environment has the same, has all the bindings from the package environment and also has a few extra, right? And then, let me see. So, and then names are bound to functions, right? Right, so names are bound to functions in both the package and namespace environments, but the function specifically sees the namespace environment. And there's an example of the standard deviation function, SD, which is defined in terms of the variance function. So, um, so here's what it is, right? So SD, there are the two environments in the package, um, and they both have SD functions bound to the same function. Right, and the namespace, right? So this, so SD is in packet stats, right? So the question is, so how does how how does SD find the variance? How how does the standard deviation find the variance? So um, so variance, so when it looks in the environment and it doesn't find variance, it's going to go to the namespace's parent, and namespace's parent is 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 stats, right? whose parent is, is base, whose parent is global environment, right? Um, and then there's the big picture, which is that, right? So here's the function at standard deviation. And when it's looking for variance, it's looking for the variance specifically in the namespace stats. All right, but we still have more environments to go. All right, so, all right, then, so apart from all of those, there's the execution environment. Sorry, let me check the chat here. I'm seeing some stuff. Um, I, I don't know the, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if anybody has it. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So, all right. So the execution environment is created fresh when the function is called. Its parent is the function environment. It's ephemeral. It means that it'll disappear unless you explicitly do something to save it. Right. Um, so here we have a function. Right. Um, it increments a every time, but yet, um, but if we run it, hold on there, so we 10, so we run it, then we get one, run it, 10. It's, it's never going to do the, the increment. Well, I mean, it will never, Right, which okay. Um, so he gives two examples. 
of of preserving um, of, of of how to preserve the execution environment. One is to explicitly return it from the function, and then the other one is to return a function which binds it, which is uh, kind of complex. Um, but here's the example of a function returning the current environment. So I can do the H2 of 10. So it returns, so this would have been the execution environment. And then the other way of returning the execution environment is to return a function and that functions environment, that functions function environment will be the current environment of the function it's in, which is the execution environment. Right? So, you know, let's go. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you, we don't have any means of checking, but, but that's the code that will retrieve the execution environment. So unless you do something, unless you take one of these special measures, you will lose the execution environment. All right. So now we get to the, uh, the other type of context, right? So the other type of context is that there's a caller, right? So a function is typically called, well, you know, a, you're calling a function which could potentially call another function. So there's a caller environment, which is the environment the function is called from. So the, the function environment, you can know pretty well when you write a function. But the caller environment can be virtually anything, basically, because anybody can call your function, right? So, so the caller environment is where the function was called from, and it's going to be where the value of the function is going to be returned to, right? right. So as functions can call each other, there are multi you know, there can be multiple functions whose evaluation is still in progress, and. This collection of caller environments is, is, is referred to as the call stack. And call stacks can be simple or they can be not simple, right? So when I say simple, I mean linear, like function f calls function g, which calls function h. That's like a linear thing. But it could also be not simple in, in that it doesn't have, that it, it, it has branches, like a tree structure. Um, so here's one example of a simple call stack you have a function f, which calls g, g calls h, and then h inside here, we uses the lobster function for the call stack. So when you evaluate f of x equal one, you get a, a simple call stack. You, we go down the tree. So we call f of x equal one. Um, f calls g of two, g calls h of three, and then, well, no. So, well, tree is the parameter, and then G calls lobster uh, CST. Yeah. And I'm, 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 I believe CST stands for a call stack tree, right? So that's like a linear function. That's like a linear call stack. But, um, you know, a more complex call stack is we have a function here, which could, a more complex call stack will arise due to lazy evaluation. Right, so you have a function A which calls B, B calls C, and, and then, right? But the, so when, now when we call A, we're gonna call it with an argument which is actually a function call. So what's gonna happen is that function call is going to get sent down the train, right? So from A down to B, down to C. So we're going down the stack here. Right, it's going down to this level and then to this level. But because R is lazy, R never evaluates F until it gets to C on the bottom. And when it gets there, it realizes it doesn't have the value. So it has to come back out to the top and then go find F in the global namespace. So it has to come down here and descend all the way down to get this function here and then come all the way back up and then uh, evaluate this, the original branch. Okay, all right. So here we get to frames. Um, 
So each tier of the call stack. So every time, so in, 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 in my mind, um, you know, every time you call a function, there's a frame, right? So, so in the previous examples, um, F was calling G. So F would, would, would create a frame at the top of the stack. When F calls G, G creates a frame at the top of the stack. And you don't get back to F until you do something to get G's, G's frame off of the top of the stack, right? Um, each frame is characterized by an expression described in the function call, an environment, um, and I have a problem with my R mark down here, um, which is typically the execution, which is typically the execution environment. Um, and then the third thing is a parent, which is the previous call in the stack, which is which function do we return to when this function gets done? All right, so, and then there's a mention of dynamic scoping. And as far as I can tell right now, because I haven't gotten to chapter 20, or maybe the, it, it doesn't exist at all in R, but R does not use dynamic scoping, but maybe somewhere it does. And he makes a kind of ominous reference to chapter 20. Well, I don't know if it's quite ominous, but when we get there, maybe there's a, you know, special case where R uses dynamic scoping. All right, and then pretty much, you know, the last thing I think is that um, he just mentioned some situations where um, environments are useful as a data structure. One is that when you wanna avoid copies of large data sets because they use reference semantics, um, you know, as opposed to copy or modify so if you want to avoid large transfers of data, you might want to use an environment. Um, there's an example, which I didn't quite get managing. Well, I, I kind of did. Um, it's down here. Yes, you use it to manage state. And this is a similar, this is a similar example to um, like set WD that that was it, that it was revealed that set wd returns the old directory um so he does something similar to here which is that he returns the old value of a name so there's a name called a and he changes the name but then also returns the old value invisibly and i'm not too sure i mean that is uh, yeah i'm not too sure what where you would use that well, I'm, I'm sure so he knows, but I, I couldn't think of when I would use it. Um, and then the third thing is as a data structure, um, because the environment by definition um, has, you know, quick access, order one access guaranteed is that if you want to implement your own hash table, because um, it doesn't seem like R has any um, internal, well, has any other hash table implementation environments have that key quick access which tells you um you know if the name exists or not uh, you know and well and an associative array with order one access if you need that you can use environments so that was the third thing um and then these were just the quiz questions from the book um i think i think i can answer them which is um, the three ways in which environments differ from a list is that, well, um, there's no ordering. Um, names have to be unique and uses reference semantics. And, and there's one more, which I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, the parent of the global environment is the most recently attached package the only environment that doesn't have a parent is the empty environment. The enclosing environment of a function is the function environment. And, and how do you determine the environment from which a function is called? There's a function, I can't remember the exact name, but I think it's caller env or env caller. And then the question as to how assignment and super assignment are different. Assignment will create a variable in the current environment if it does not, if, if, if the name is not bound. Super assignment 
will not create a new variable in the current environment. And that's, okay, so that's what I have on chapter seven. Any questions or anybody wanna? Darren, this was so cool. So is this, I guess this whole thing is a shiny app that you'll upload to the repo? Yeah, I will. I, I also have some slides. Well, yeah, because I, I but yeah, so I made um, a slide version as well, but I will upload cool. both of them. Yeah. Now that you're like the resident expert on Learner, so like the function, when I asked you to like modify where to, so yeah. is there a way to like store that code when you press run code? Um, you know um, what I mean? Yeah, where was that? Um, no, so it might come back. Where is that? Cool environments. This was, that, that, that we did was it in the recursion. Yeah, that was before. All right, so. Sorry. Okay. Well, the good thing is that it does seem to, it keeps my code in, in the app, but I don't know the answer to, to what I believe you're asking. I mean, this is on video. I can always just, and I took a screenshot, but I was just curious if there's some way to like store that code. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. Probably not. Cool. Okay. This was so awesome. And I really like the format of live coding. That was really brave, but I think it <laughs> helped me, it helped me to, to make these concepts a little bit more concrete. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I saw that there were some questions in the Q and A. Um, do you, you have them or? Um, I, I not particularly good answers. Well, I was thinking about them, but I don't know if anybody else or. You yeah, want to ask I can. I could I can go ahead and share or because it's late I can put them in the chat whatever I mean in the Slack channel whatever anyone prefers. Um, well, I'm available. Okay, I'll um, we could share for sure. a little. Okay. Cool. I think since we're all here, I'd prefer to go through what we can, and then if people start leaving, then uh, we can finish up in the Slack. Cool. Um, uh, Scott, can I get uh? the ability to share please um, yep yeah, okay i think i have the ability oh but i okay i don't have the Come on I, now. Got it. I got it cool okay let me see my screen it's now I, I can see your screen. Two A. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so I think you talked a little bit about this one. Does anyone else? It it really makes sense to me that you can't use the double brackets because um your this your environment is just like this cloud of stuff, but the the singular bracket, and this is the explanation they give, but that is in English to me. Does anyone have any ways to expand on that? The second option will take two objects at the same time. My understanding is more like the single bracket returns an object of the same type, and you can't return an, the, you can't subset an, you can't like return, you don't, it doesn't return another environment with just that thing in it. Interesting. So like the double pulls out the object of the environment. The single doesn't return another environment. It's my understanding. Whereas like when you do a data frame and you subset with a single bracket, you return a data frame with one column in it. I think that makes sense to me. 
Um, That's how I understand it anyway, so. I'll love that is my understanding as well, but I, I don't get where the two objects, you know, I found that two objects to be very mysterious. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but so do I. My understanding is that it wouldn't work. <laughs> or it doesn't work as intended. Okay. I mean, because Hadley, Hadley said so, right? It just seems weird. I, I just want to do that with an environment. <laughs> you shouldn't write a book, Tony, of just like, just don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> or why would you do that? Okay. Um, Hadley briefly mentions using in bind lazy, which you gave a great example, um, and says that this is commonly used for auto loading data sets. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if anyone, just like the source code that Tan posted into the chat, had on hand like a uh, some source code that uses this function for loading a data set because i i'm a package noob i would like to start reading source code and and like seeing um i don't know where how say the diamonds data set is loaded in or whatever um yeah so that was just a, a more like broad question and if anyone wants to just throw that into the chat um yeah, that'd be cool um... And so isn't that concept kind of uh, used, you know, whenever you just type in iris at the, you know, at your console, it knows, I mean, I guess R is looking on your search path. It's, I guess it's essentially yeah. using that. So that's like, that, from my understanding, and I could be wrong, that's like the user's experience. But when you're developing a package, where does Iris actually live? And you want to say, like, don't load this massive data set until the user asks for it, right? Yeah, so I think that has to do with how you include data, I mean, in packages, and it stores it in a certain format. I don't know, I've done that once before, and I don't remember having to, like, specifically write something to say, oh, only load this lazily, you know, uh, instead of like soon like on active binding so yeah I, I don't remember exactly the details of it but it might just be something that happens when you store data in a data set or in a package yeah then i then i was reading the package book briefly and then the, in that book it doesn't even use this function it says like in your um description file just have lazy data colon true so i didn't know that relationship either but maybe that's for another discussion of another book on packages um i think so i i had some questions about this code here but darren did a really good job going through that so i think we're good there um doo -doo 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 -doo. and i also think darren it's it's just going to take me a while to really wrap my head around that second figure where you create a function that's referenced in a different environment. I don't, I, I guess I don't really understand like the when or like a real world example of doing that. Um, a real world example of, of creating a function. Oh, I don't think about it. So, yeah, I, I don't have anything on top of my head. Um, so, if if y was not defined, what would that call that call the g in the e environment? It would just well, you have a show function and. That's not a good question. Um, we could yeah. think on it. Well, we can run. Um, and then I think Tan answered this one in the chat where I was wondering about like hiding functions from the user, and that's when you—that's what the triple colon is. 
I've never really used that or seen it. So um, if anyone has a resource to point to for that, that'd be cool. Um, and then I guess on a broader level, what kind of functions would you hide from the user? They're just functions to make your package run, not functions of the package. They're like meta functions, I guess. Yeah, they're uh, like helper functions that uh, you don't really need the user to use, really. Maybe it could be something simple, like, oh, I always want to suffix my strings with this, you know, a uh, certain other string. And it's just not important to the user, but maybe it's helpful for... Yeah, like, that makes sense. All right, and then... I was kind of confusing this example with the one in the prior chapter that uses on exit for setting your work and getting your work directory. Cause it kind of sounds like that's what you're doing here, like a new environment and then old environment. But do, would you use on exit in this in some way? Could you, or am I just confounding ideas? You would use on exit primarily when you're looking at something that's like, so this function, has an effect, which is it sets my end A to this new value. That's a side effect of the function, and it's not really like a functional which is returning something, if you will. Okay. So when sense. you call this function, it's like setting the work directory, but instead of the work directory, you're setting my end A. Um, and so it's affecting an object outside of the function itself. And then when you return old invisibly it's because it you're, you, it's not an explicit return because it you know you don't actually need it but if you wanted to you could capture old outside of this function and say okay so this used to be this and then on exit set it back to that um got it you do. interesting i might play with that or um ping you later to help me play with that all right, and then my last question here was if someone in the in this club has a has a CS background, what the heck is a hash table? And I tried I used Wikipedia and the word every word in the definition is like also has to be I also had to Wikipedia. Like I went down a Wikipedia rabbit hole. Is there a simple definition for what the heck a hash table is. Data structure. Uh, data structure is also that's like answering like. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, okay. <laughs> I, I yeah no I, I learned about it a long time ago but I, yeah it's what so like what in Python. I think dictionaries are implemented as hash maps, right? So it's like a key value kind of mapping. And the, the, the special property of them is like the keys are stored in a way that makes it really efficient. Whenever you're trying to go find a specific key, it, it finds it very quickly just because of the way the hash map is. So they're like lookup tables? Yeah, yeah. You can, you can think of them as lookup tables. They're just unsorted lookup tables. So it's like... You, if you insert them okay. in a certain way, they won't exactly be ordered that same way. But so the way it works what? out is it's like very quick to look up the value. Okay, so then now that I kind of understand that, what was your last slide, Darren, about these lookup tables in reference to environments? Is that how the like name value thing is happening or? Uh, no, no. So. Well, I think what he was just making a general statement is that if you need a hash table, environments are the machinery that's available in R to, you know, to just create a hash to, table. Yeah, to, to create, because environments, because when you, a hash table is, well, it's a lookup table, but um, the, the expectation of a hash table is specifically that lookup is fast, right? So meaning like order one, I don't know, that, that notation O1 means that, you know, in constant time, as opposed to um, 
Ah, okay. So maybe I shouldn't. Right, so so um, order one means that lookup doesn't isn't based on the size of the hash table or the size of the data that you're looking through. Okay. So, right. So um, if 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 it was order n, it would be a function of the size of the data that you're looking through. But order one means that it's constant time, which means that as the amount of data you store increases, your hash table doesn't slow down. Um, with a hash table, you is you want it to be fast, um, both in retrieving and you want it to tell you very quickly if the name you're looking for isn't there. Um, other than that, I, I, you know, it comes up a lot in like general software development. Um, and I think he's just saying, if you need a hash table, this is what R has to use. Okay, that makes sense. I think I need to look up like baby's first hash table or something. <laughs> Darren, Darren brought up a like, big O notation. I think it's like a really hard task not to bring up big O whenever you're talking about hash tables. But he actually got around that, so. <laughs> Thank you for us lowly non-computer people. I think that, that made sense though. Um, yeah, that was it for me for questions. I think this chapter is like really hard to grasp. So you, Darren, thank you so much. You did such a great job presenting some difficult material. Um, I don't think we have a presenter for next week. Does someone want to nominate themselves? I'll give it a day or two. What and, is the topic? Uh, What's um, the next chapter? What is the topic? Uh, conditions. Uh, this is like stop warning and error type of. Yeah, stop warning message. Try catch um, with calling here, calling handlers. Uh, I'm happy to do it if if no one else wants to. I just don't want to bereft anyone of giving a presentation. Thank you. Hey, um, can I ask a question before Darren leaves? Because he's he just explained that so well. Um, is that okay, Maya? Yeah, of course. Hey, uh, so Darren, um, you know the the figure where you have the SD and the var. Um, yes. I'm really sorry to bring this up again. Um, and I mean, like, you don't have to pull up. I mean, I don't know if you can pull it up or share no. your screen again. Um, I just had like a, a conceptual question uh, about how to read this figure. So. Um, uh, let, me, let me share. Okay, thank you. Um, if I can find. Okay, so. Where is that? So it's the one where you had the the SD and the bar and then the namespace, the imports. Wall. Yeah, I'm trying to remember um, which namespace. Oh, the which wall? Uh, so I think it's seven point four three. I think uh, namespaces. Yeah. Yeah. Or the next one, perhaps. Yeah. Okay, okay. So I'm just a little bit confused. So this is where. So the one all the way to the left. That is your function. So that's actually that like. The the, the yeah. that's your variable and then uh, what does that huge circle represent is that like just your environment or like what is what what is the, this circle yeah <laughs> that's just how he draws a function okay so it's not uh, referring to either the environment or the functional environment or the the variables in the environment or the uh, the parameters so, or whatever so no no so I mean, so X is the input for the function. This, this shape is how he chosen to, to draw a function. Okay. Uh, so X is the, is the input. Okay. Um, and the function is binding this environment. And then 
and then the SD function, both in namespace stats and in packet stats, have no. So both the namespace, both um, the namespace environment and the package environment have names SD bound to the function. Um, oh. But if, right. But when the function is running, its environment is this one over here. Because of the order in which the package is attached? Um, well, I, no, so the function, okay, so our function within our package is, 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 is constructed so that it's, it, it, it is seen in the namespace stats. Okay, okay, okay. Right? It's, yeah. it's by construction. And this SD here is what you will see when you're using it. So when you use SD, it's bound to this. But this function here is seeing the var in namespace stats. So you as a user are calling uh, you're referencing the name SD in, in here. So what? <laughs> so when would that function X ever be called? I mean, um, I don't know. I guess X is the function. So X is the X is the X is the input. I believe. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's my that I mean, well, that's my understanding. So, right. So it's because the function standard deviation takes take an input vector. So and I and I believe X is the um, is 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 the name of that vector. Okay. Actually, you can see. Right. So S D. So that's what it means. This this S D is is that X. That X is is the X parameter. I see. Okay. Oh. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Hey, thanks a lot. That made sense. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Um, I'll stop sharing again. Anybody else? No. Is it? We're good. All right. This was really awesome. Thank you so much. And I'll see you guys next week. All right. Over here. Um, ciao. All right. Good Have a good night. Thank you so Bye. much, Dad. It was awesome. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.